this video, I will be going into an in-depth analysis of OpenGL draw calls from the game Sub Rosa by Cryptic Sea. I will also be comparing it to two other things, uh, Dark Places running Nexuis, and my own little engine, which is still in development and not very fleshed out. I I'm sorry for any sort of voice problems. Uh, it is currently pollen season, and it's also way too hot to close the window. So, we'll just have to make do. Alright, let's first do next series. I'm going to be using API Trace for this, um, as it is very easy to use and uh, very featureful. start a new trace. Now, one of the things you have to keep in mind when examining traces, and especially counts of OpenGL calls, is some calls are worth more than others. A shader state change, um, switching shaders, uh, you know, switching textures is a lot more costly than, say, changing a uniform or issuing a GL draw elements call. So let's first hop right into game so I don't spam it with 1000 FPS of 2D. Alright, as you can see, I'm actually currently playing this game right now. At many, you know, the frame rate is very high, Oops. <laughs> and in API Trace, uh, now it's getting kind of stuttery because it has to write to disk, in API Trace it is very high overhead when doing this. So even with very high overhead next week's, while it is a lot less than running it natively, without API trace. It's still rather playable. I mean, I don't think anyone would disagree that, you know, 150, 200 frames per second is not playable. Alright, let's get into the actual rendering calls. And as you can see here, it is a little less than 3,000 calls per frame. A lot of GeoDraw elements with some uniforms in between them, and these are very cheap to do, and that's why they're all grouped. Doing state changes and binding buffers is a little more expensive, but not quite as expensive as changing shader and changing uh, textures, and also frame buffers. Those are quite expensive. So as you can see here, we get into a little bit more texture switching. Um, and to show you that this is actually one of the 3D calls, I can run it until this. This is API Trace playing back all the OpenGL calls. This is one of the reasons why API Trace uses so much uh, RAM and memory and performance and disk space is because it records every single OpenGL call and all the data that it is sent as well. Now, as you saw, that ended during the actual gameplay. We can look here and see what is currently bound. Although, oops, there we go. Come on. I, have to do that. I guess I have to do that again. Um, Dark Places and Nexuries specifically is a game that uses strictly or mostly OpenGL 2.1 features. There's no instancing, there's no VAOs, there's no special stuff. Alright. I'm on. I see. <laughs> there we go. Have to do it again. This will just give me the this will just give me time to talk. <laughs> um so this game is, I mean, it is a indoor game, so it's not drawing like terribly many things, but it does have 
a wide variety of textures and models, and it is a forward rendered game. Come on. It's looking up the state, I guess. So every time, for every li for every light on every single surface, it has to draw do another draw call for that light. So we can see the shaders that it uses, a bunch of textures, some frame buffer information, including depth, stencil, and the back buffer. This is why this is really nice. The font <laughs> that it uses. Everything. So, let's say Dark Places has at most 2,000 calls per frame during active gameplay. That is for nowadays using OpenGL 3 and OpenGL 4 and the advanced features in there that could probably be lowered a lot but Dark Places by no means draw call limited especially since its draw calls are mostly the cheap things like geo draw range elements these are extremely cheap compared to uh, geo use program it's an extremely expensive draw call alright now let's switch to ENA Engine which is my own uh, work Generate new trace. Great. This also is running rather decently. Um, usually it gets about maybe a thousand FPS natively. As you can see here, it's getting 400 frames per second. This game engine has. Um, fully deferred lighting and it's rendering about 50 lights at this point and thousands upon thousands of objects in the world and a lot of moving entities and stuff like that so it is I mean it's it's par fairly simple right now but it's nothing to shake a stick at as you can see here the per frame draw calls is extremely low and compared to dark places it's a lot less but it also is a lot more, it's more dense of high cost draw calls. So, GeoUse program right here, GeoUse program right here, texture stuff. Whereas Dark Places had a use program separated by hundreds and hundreds of Geo draw range elements. That's why Dark Places has, you know, over 10 times the amount of draw calls, but still manages to perform extremely well, even in API Trace. Um, we can run it to this point, as you can see that it was in fact a 3D state. And this is a 3D frame. So the main reason why this works so well is because or this uh, engine has so little draw calls is because it uses uh, instancing, VAOs, uniform buffers. So it really, I mean, it just has to, it does not have to do much, especially when it only has to do a few textures and a few shaders um, in one scene. Um, so, not much at all. Let's move on to Sub Reels Up. I will be running just the demo, which does not connect to the server and does not have. It's not a full. You know, it's not the full game. It does not have, you know, thousand or, uh, you know, eight or so players running around shooting stuff, leaving bullets and crumbs and broken windows all around. So that is. It's going to be a sl little bit less draw calls. All right, demo. As you can see here, it is absolutely chugging while being profiled. You'll see why in a minute. Compared to Dark Places, which got over 100 frames per second, 
most of the time over 150 frames per second while in API trace and compared to my own engine which got over 400 frames per second while in API trace this is getting approximately 2 this is Alt F4 hopefully can get rid of it, there we go painful Now, this is rendering the menus and 2D elements. Let's go to actually in-game. Notice how there's not that many frames, because it's only doing about 2 frames per second. Let's look at one of the... Most of these have over 10,000 calls. And one thing we can notice... Off the bat is a lot of texture calls, especially ones that use the same texture over and over again. This looks like it may be drawing a car or uh, a player model or some textured model that has uh, a few different textures it needs and a few different parts of the model to draw, except instead of rendering all the things with Texture 26, which we can actually go uh, see what that is. It does them all in order. Like this is a per model thing. First, find this texture and then render this part. So, the problem with this is instead of organizing the draw calls in such a way that you only have to, you can render everything with texture 26 and then render everything with texture 38 and everything with texture 41 is doing them all separately. This means that there is a lot of these GeoBind texture calls and texture switches are one of the more expensive calls. And as you can see it does this a lot. Here we get into some more simple things and this would be a lot better performing than all that Geo texture bind stuff. This is probably the best performing part of the calls at this point, but is still quite a lot of calls, especially one considering that it looks to be like it's only drawing maybe 20 uh, vertices. 96 bytes is not a lot of data. Yes, 24 vertices, right there. Does this quite a lot. Now we get into some old... Uh, actually, the stuff up there could have been 2D elements, The all that texture switching. That might be possibly what it was. I'm not sure, though. Then we get back down here where it starts to looks like it starts to draw some 3D things and or not starts but continues and it's using the old fixed function uh, matrix stuff and this I mean in OpenGL 2.1 the preferred way to do it is upload matrices uh, via uniforms we get a lot of that a lot of GeoTranslate a lot of this a lot of that and I'm not completely sure on VBO usage because I'm used to using VAOs, but doing a lot of geo vertex pointer calls is probably redundant and uh, can probably be optimized out for most of this, even without using vertex array objects. Uh, let's see especially, and also this client state, there's a lot of those calls as well. I think this was actually doing the depth only prepass because it did not do any texture switches. And it also, uh, yeah, did not do any texture switches. But it would have to have a frame buffer switch somewhere. Here's one of the first uh, 
shader switches that we see, and it's an ARB call, even though that has been GLU's program, has been in mainline OpenGL for quite a long time, it's using the ARB one. This is uh, maybe Stencil Shadow stuff. Let's continue going down. More matrix annoyances. This could all be easily done in OpenGL 2.1 with a one single call to uh, GL Uniform. And of course, in modern graphics drivers, it that's actually how it's done. This is pretty much in the driver. It just translates this into uniform calls and does it manually, or does it in the driver instead. It's quite a lot of draw calls to have to go through. Um, draw radius. Oh, ah, here we start drawing some full screen quads with GeoBegin. Now, GeoBegin is not a preferred method of doing it, but it is only drawing a single full screen quad. So it isn't as bad as uh, you know drawing like a whole mesh with GeoBegin and GeoFortex 2F and all that fun stuff. Here we actually get into some uniform settings, which is nice. And we get into the old fixed function OpenGL 1 lighting. Again, this should be done through uniforms. And nowadays in drivers, it is uh, just automatically in the driver translated to uniform calls. But it's slower to do it that way because the driver has to do it and it has to figure out what it actually is going on. Of course, we have these possibly redundant enable client state calls. I am not entirely sure if they're redundant or not. And we have also have a lot of these texture ping-pongings with a lot, a ton of redundant shader switch calls. You, again, even though it is the same shader that's being bound, um, depending on implementation, different drivers, different uh, computers, it still might actually be a pretty heavy uh, call to make. And this could be vastly reduced by having a state manager, which basically just checks. It just, in your own program, it would just keep track of the current, you know, one, the current program object bound. And if it's different, it would bind it. Otherwise, it wouldn't. Um, that will vastly reduce them. A lot of redundant shader calls. Like, quite a lot. Here we go. More. This is probably actually drawing a bunch of buildings in the game as they're fairly simple. Now, for as we scroll through this, for optimizing, one of the ways to do reduce the amount of calls and re reduce the amount of the switching, especially when you're ping-pong between two different textures, most of the time, when you're drawing opaque objects, it does not really matter what order you draw them in. For the output image. So, what an optimal way to be, w optimal way to do it would be draw everything with one texture, switch textures, and then draw everything with another texture. Switch textures, continue instead of drawing one little part of the mesh, switching textures again, another little part of the mesh, switching textures again, hundreds of times. This way, you can draw most of the objects in the scene. Say you have maybe 10 textures total, instead of switching those textures 10 times per object, say 100 objects, you would draw, you'd switch textures once, draw 100 objects, 
switch textures again draw 100 objects and it comes out to be a 10 texture switches and a uh, thousand draw calls if you do it the other way it would be a thousand texture switches and a thousand draw calls and texture switches are rather expensive to do both CPU side and GPU side and they get even more expensive when switching from a power of two texture to a non-power of two texture. So here we see it again. We have 41, 42, 38, 41, 42, 38, 41, 42, 38, and um, the only transparent surfaces in this game currently are uh, some decals and some windows. The windows all use the same exact texture. And the decals are either blood decals or bullet impact decals. The decals do not need to be sorted because they're against a flat surface and therefore it doesn't really matter if you have a decal drawn in front of the other one because they're on a flat surface and it, nobody would notice any apparent layering in that. The windows do have to be drawn and sorted, but since they're all the same texture, they can just be all drawn at once with one texture switch. So doing this texture ping-ponging is not needed at all and can be optimized and reduced. The way to do this, one of the possible ways to do this, would be use a, um, a queue in which every time you want to draw something you'd load it into the queue and you'd give it some uh, data to sort by. In my case, in my engine, I use 10 bytes of sorting data and this is ordered mostly in shader, then texture, then model for buffer usage, and then um, and then after that, I can sort it from front to back, so it's uh, less overdraw. If you were doing transparent particles, you could put the distance from the camera back to front as the most, the highest priority sorting thing. Then you would sort that with a radix sort, and then just go through that queue and render things out, only switching when you have to using the state manager. This will vastly reduce the texture draw calls, especially when going 38, 41, 42, 38, 41, 42, etc. And the sorting is extremely fast and can be used for sorting anything. More matrix stuff. Also, this game sends quite a lot of data through buffers and just GL draw arrays um, per frame. It does this partly because it's just uploading a lot of data to the graphics card and also because it, all of the skeletal animation is done on CPU. Now this would be fine except for the fact that it does not cull uh, the players and NPCs in the game very well, and it will draw, you know, hundreds of players and NPCs even if you can't see them, uploading all of their skeletal data, even if it hasn't changed every frame. <laughs> this can be greatly reduced by um, not drawing everyone, and I will get into that in a later video or by using uh, GLSL hardware accelerated shader based skeletal uh, mesh skinning. Dark Places uses this and Dark Places is fully OpenGL 2.1 or DirectX 9.0c compliant. This feature can be fully implemented on those uh, APIs and graphics cards. So Subrosa could use that to reduce the amount of data being sent back and forth, which 
will probably have a slight improvement, but not as much as just optimizing the order and draw calls that it uses. If the developer wanted, they could also update to OpenGL 3 and use vertex array objects, vertex buffer objects, or vertex array objects instancing uniform buffers to vastly reduce the draw calls. As you can see, we're only two-thirds of the way through a single frame, and we've already gone through a lot, especially when we're doing stuff like this. Now this is just... This is a GeoBegin drawing a whole mesh. This is kind of sad. I do not know what this mesh is, but it has a lot of vertices, and each vertice has a normal. And this is thousands of draw calls spent to one drawing one mesh. Now, granted, these calls are not terribly expensive, but it is a lot more calls than needed, and it would be faster if done with GL draw arrays or loading it into a vertex buffer object and using GeoDraw elements or anything. It also appears that this does not use or use very much of indices, especially when you find things like this and a lot of GeoDraw arrays, not GeoDraw elements. Most vertices in the game are connected, however, it is flat shaded, so it would need a separate uh, triangle for every, or a separate set of vertices for every triangle in order to get the normals correct. So that may be one reason why uh, not using indices is acceptable in this case. Here we go, here is some. 2D stuff and post-processing. Also done in GeoBegin, and which is not terribly bad, but it is doing a lot of these calls, and they add up quite a lot. The main issue for here would be uh, redundant state changes, which can be fixed with a st uh, built-in state manager fairly easy to do, or, uh, actually no, you would do that with a state manager pretty much. Um, and the other main issue is ordering the draw calls, which can be done with a render queue style system like Quake 3's render queue, which is a very good model to base a render queue off of. It is very flexible, it can be used to be, can be used to draw just about anything. Uh, if you would like to learn how to do these, uh, my own engine implements both State Manager and Render Queue uh, in it, and the source is available on github.com slash user, github.com slash robotman2444 slash ENA engine. There, finally at the end of that frame. So that is about it for the in-depth analysis and that wasn't that in-depth because there's just so many frames that have to be looked at so I can't do like a frame by frame basis but I can notice some things that could be improved and that is what this video showed. I might do some more stuff in a future video but that is all for now and uh, I hope it was either educational or my soothing voice made you relaxed, something like that. So thank you for watching this 30 minute long video, and have a good day.